Welcome to today's colloquium presentation by the WAC group. We'll be talking about writing at EOU. How is it working across the curriculum? The WAC group is made up of faculty who are from different um, disciplines across the, the campus. Um, Tony Tovar is from physics. Sarah Ralston, who's over here, is from the library. Rhonda Fritz from education and Aaron Thornburg from anthropology. In previous years, we've had several other um, participants, including Steve Clements, a retired business faculty, Michael Heather from theater, uh, Kelly McNeil, who's here with us today, from physical activity and health, and Doug Briney from business. We have a lot of thank yous to give. The first one to faculty in particular. Faculty have participated with us by responding to the call for writing samples from capstone and 400 level UWR courses and from first year writing and UWR classes. Thank you to the Office of the Provost. Um, Sarah Witt listened to my proposal for a three-year strategic assessment of writing and, um, and the UWR at EOU, allowing the plan to proceed and for providing the WAC group with residual funds from grants that I worked on earlier in my time at EOU. Thank you also to the Office of the Vice Provost and Donald Wolf and CTLA for collaborating with the WAC group to provide faculty development workshops, including food, which is really important, stipends, and John Bean's book, Engaging Ideas. He also made a lot of the arrangements for actually accessing the, 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 the venues. Next, thank you to the college offices. College offices for access to archived syllabi used in our first year um, research. To institutional research, including Nathan Smuts, who is here with us also, for helping to refine our request for data and generating data reports used in our second and third year. And then finally, we're grateful again to Sarah Witt for allowing us to use residual funds from the DQP and the WICHE Interstate Passport Grant that I was one of the participants on in my first years. So writing at EOU, how does it work? Today we're going to give you an overview that includes a background of how we got started. We'll review syllabi, our review of syllabi for UWR criteria and UWRs in majors and minors. For assessment of writing in capstone papers across the disciplines. The relationship between UWR, UWR courses and grades, completion, and more. And finally, we're going to have discussion and you'll have a chance to participate in that. This project began with my interest in writing programs and assessment. I'm grateful to Susan Whitelock, who was my methods of tutoring um, instructor when I was an undergraduate at EOU, because she introduced me to the idea of a WAC writing center. Later on in my graduate studies, I studied it more thoroughly. Um, over the last 14 years, I've attended presentations at major conferences, participated in workshops with, with renowned faculty in the field, including Hewitt, Caswell, Clages, Elliott, Peckham, Lynn, Anson, Yancey, Perlman, and others. These may not mean much to you if you're not in writing assessment, but they're, they're important people who have really pushed this uh, field um, to the forefront of writing. They're also listed in our work cited at the end of this presentation. I consulted with several of these experts while, um, while developing the draft of the strategic um, assessment plan that we used for this WAC inquiry. Um, I took the assessment plan to Provost Witt and Vice Provost uh, Wolf and requested permission to put the plan into, ac into action and also a request for funding. Small residual balances, as I've mentioned before, have helped us with that and supported our work. Uh, 
I then went to deans and asked um, them for permission to ask their faculty to participate in this WAC group. This is not an official committee. It's not an official council. It's nothing that was um, begun from above. It was my idea, and it started with that plan. Um, the invitation to collaborate wasn't just to go out and have fun, though. And the stipends that, is, uh, were, that accompanied them were meant to help, um, help um, incite faculty to stay in the group, really. Uh, we know from experience with working with uh, faculty in writing assessment, the stipends uh, make a difference as to whether people participate. That's true in workshops also. And so whenever we try to get away from using stipends, we find low participation. Um, each WAC group member was expected to sp spend a minimum of 8 to 12 hours per term. I tried to keep the workload between that, that range because I didn't want to interfere with other um, uh, things that were on their agendas. And then we began meeting in fall 2015 as the WAC group. And again, this is an informal name, but we've adopted it and we like it. The first thing we did after forming was to begin discussing what it meant to have a WAC group. What was, were we going to do? Why were we going to do it? Was there any real reason to take this work on when we weren't being asked to do it? So um, we began developing a WAC mission statement, which is posted in full on the Writing Center WAC page. Uh, the WAC mission supports the view that writing aids in learning and critical thinking. That writing should happen across the academic community throughout a student's formal education. Not just in one class, not just in the major, but across the community. We're committed to ensuring that all students receive attention to writing throughout their studies in small class environments. In fact, in a UWR course, it's necessary to keep the cap fairly low because the workload for faculty and students is high and feedback is necessary. So lower caps on UWR courses are necessary and they need to be, they need to be guarded. Um, we are also committed um, to writing in the disciplines, which means that we're, we're committed to supporting faculty across the curriculum in whatever discipline that they may be, physics, math, computer science, uh, biology, writing, anthropology, any, any and all uh, program. And we want them to think about the, the discipline-specific conventions that they follow in their own writing and how best to, um, to teach those to their students. Another part of our WAC mission, although not stated as goals or as objectives, are that we want students to actually do something. We want them to develop habits of mind and communication skills necessary to play productive roles in their disciplines, careers, and communities. So not just here, but when they go out to work and when they go into the community. We want them to be able to write to support those different um, areas of their lives. We also want them to be prepared for responsible and reflective action in a diverse and interconnected world. Well, what does that mean? Well, if any of you are on Facebook, you know that our diverse and interconnected Facebook fell apart yesterday. And so many of us weren't able to access it. We weren't able to see our friends, talk to them, that sort of thing. What does it mean? What do you do? Okay, that's just one venue. There are so many different places to write, and students need to do that. First of all, they need to do academic writing, and they need to learn the requirements of their fields. Okay, one of the first things that we did um, after developing the mission statement is we talked about what we wanted students to be, well, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going over another slide again, never mind. See, I have two hands, I need three. Okay. To find out how the UWR is discussed, we requested access to writing and UWR syllabi across the university that were available in fall 2015. This was before dedicated archives 
of uh, representative syllabi were available in college offices. In fact, it was before the College of Arts and Sciences was divided into two. Um, we had to access um, these that were submitted by individual f uh, faculty rather than a representative syllabus because we wanted to see what each faculty was doing in regards to the UWR requirement. Not all sections or courses were represented in the, in the study. A list of UWR courses were downloaded in advance from Webster to assure that available syllabi were actually UWR courses. So we are sure that what we measured, what we looked at, were UWRs. Each syllabus was reviewed by two group members, and data were collected using a Google form. Data gathered focused on whether UWR outcomes and expectations had been explicitly copied into the syllabus and or assignments provided evidence of alignment with UWR outcomes. Well, what does that mean? As you can see up here, we have the UWR uh, criteria as bulleted on, um, on the UWR page on uh, the English Writing Web the website. And we broke those down, simplified them just a little bit, but we looked for all of those things to be present, either in the syllabus or within the text of the syllabus. Okay, either listed as UWR criteria or indicated by the assignments that were, were given and that the student understood why they were doing this work. Okay. This slide shows our findings for lower division UWR syllabi in fall 2015. In the lower division, UWS, um, UWR syllabus review, nine syllabi examinations were completed with two syllabi unavailable. So there were 11 UWRs taught that fall, according to our records. Okay, so then we went on to the upper division. And here we had more samples available. The same process was followed for reviewing upper division UWR courses. The upper division UWR syllabus review for fall 2015 included 19 reviews with eight additional unavailable. So there were, 27, there were 27 total UWR courses that fall. Syllabi archives contained 70% of upper division UWR syllabi taught in 2015. Um, and then 70% of those had the criteria for UWR entered in some way. An average of 70% had, had the criteria listed. If you take a look here though, um, for example, explicit or implicit mention that students will be introduced to discourse forms appropriate to the discipline. Less than half of those syllabi that we had access to mentioned that in the syllabus. And then um, some of these others, um, for example, the lowest one, 29%, clearly, clearly states students must earn a C- minus or better on writing assignments. Only 29% mentioned that. And so either that has to be clearly built in to the grading uh, formulas for the class, or students um, may wonder why um, they, they haven't passed a UWR course. I think that most of us have done that when we took our courses through EPCC, but still the students don't know why. So um, it, let's see, others that we might be interested in. This last one, 48%, indicates that at least 30% of the overall grade is based on formal writing assignments, with at least 25% of the overall grade based on evaluation of individually written papers that have been revised after feedback. So what we found here was that in the lower division, um, while we had more uh, syllabi to access, there was more mention of the UWR. In the upper division, there was less specific and explicit mention of the UWR. We also looked at check sheets to see how UWRs were distributed within majors and minors at EOU. Now note that um, OSU offers seven minors on the EOU campus, but we only looked at the 27 EOU minors. We looked at all of their check sheets and um, we found that nine check sheets um, for minors included at least one UWR. So nine out of 27, 33.3% of the minors have a UWR. 
um, eight of those listed at least two UWR courses. So 29.6, just slightly under, um, had two ex specific UWR courses listed in their check sheets. In the majors, <clears throat> we found that um, um, of the 37 programs, 46% required a UWR capstone outcome. Now, this is where we can't say that our, our uh, data is entirely accurate. Not every um, culminating program, not every culminating um, project or, um, or, um, or paper or class is marked capstone. So when we looked for a capstone course that had a UWR, it was difficult to identify them. In a future review of the syllabi or in the check sheets, we would want to get a list of, of culminating courses from the registrar that are li link listed as UWRs. So recommendations from this first year's work. We recommend that the syllabi review be repeated at some point. This would mean that we'd have to do a separate syllabus collection um, so that we had a syllabus from each UWR course rather than just a representative syllabus from one course. Because, as you all know, faculty have, um, um, have the, the right to uh, vary their syllabi somewhat. We want to see whether the things that are necessary are there, however. Um, next, we recommend that we discuss as an institution how UWR criteria should be presented to students. If it's not in this syllabus, or if it's not mentioned on the first day and subsequently, um, how does the student know what it is that they're being expected to do? Examine where writing in the discipline is occurring in the minors. Um, this may have changed over the last three and a half years. The check sheets may have changed, the goals may have changed for programs. But we would recommend a review of that to see if there are some UWRs embedded in all minors. So that students who leave here, say having done, um, um, let's call it integrative studies with two minors, let's make sure that those students have done some writing in the disciplines as well as in their integrative studies capstone courses. I think that's true of other um, programs also. In that we found so few UWRs in minors, I think it's really um, important to us to, to think about what it is that students are missing out on by not doing disciplinary writing in their minors and then going out and working in areas where these minors are being um, sought after. In majors that do not specify a capstone or project, identify an upper division course for writing assessment. And again, I go back to the issue, we can contact the registrar next time, now that we know, and um, have them identify all of the upper division UWR courses, including the culminating courses, so that we can determine how the UWR is being presented to students. And then finally, and always, provide opportunities for faculty development. There are other uh, recommendations made in that first year's report, and I'll come back to that later. Let's see if I have anything else for you. Oh, I do. Yes, I do. Um, I should say that the professional development, we have done some of that. And um, over from the first year's uh, report, from the first year's study, we presented two workshops in the fall orientation. One was called What's in Your Syllabus? A Wacky Workshop, where faculty were asked to bring a printed or digital copy of a syllabus with them and meet in the library computer classroom to work together on the UWR aspects of that syllabus. And then Writing Assignments That Matter, a Wacky Forum. Faculty were asked to bring a writing assignment to share. This involved a guided conversation around designing writing assignments to address outcomes. Um, another thing that's been done after looking at this first year's study, Tony Tovar took it on himself to create an FAQ page for, um, for UWR instructors. And that's available on the WAC page of the Writing Center webpage. 
it's a really useful page. And for any new faculty, we'd recommend that you guide them there. That means it's my turn. Um, and I should tell you that we have to attribute all those wacky words and those titles to Tony Tovar. He's the one that thought that was hilarious. And I to make sure we called them that. And of course, we thought so, so we didn't. Um, so after we finished that syllabi review, our next project was a capstone um, review. So what we did was requested across the entire university capstone papers that we could review. We asked for high, medium, and low representations of those capstones so that we could get a really clear view of um, the range of abilities and skills that our students had. So uh, what we ended up with were 30 papers. We got between one and six papers for each program, and we represented all of those programs that you see up there on the slides. Um, We used um, what's called the Written Communication Value Rubric, and this rubric was designed by faculty members across the nation who um, used syllabi or used rubrics from different universities and tried to come up with one common rubric that would be something that we could evaluate student writing with at a university level. It wasn't really something we wanted to look across the nation, but just each university could use that and adapt it for their own purposes um, to evaluate the student writing in their schools. So um, it has a four-point scale. It uses a four-point scale, and it has um, a context and purpose for writing, and um, content development, genre and disciplinary conventions, sources and evidence, and control of syntax and mechanics. And for each of those different areas, there are very specific descriptors of what it would look like at each level, zero to four. So um, we, we trained, actually Donna was instrumental in helping us understand how to use that rubric, and we spent a lot of time trying to get reliable with it, which wasn't the easiest process. So the way we did that is we, um, we read some common papers and then scored them independently, came back together and discussed how we scored that uh, to try to come to some sort of consensus across a few different papers uh, before she turned us loose with uh, papers with, from students. Um, we uh, then used that information that, well, then she divvied up all the papers. And did we have two people for each paper? Yeah. So each paper was read by two different people, and if there was some sort of discrepancy, we came back and talked about that to uh, try to come to consensus on a paper if, there, if we weren't in agreement. So this is kind of the general overview of what we found from those papers. Uh, the, remember that the uh, scale is four, so in content of and purpose for writing, they were actually pretty strong at 2.85 overall. So that is, con that is taking into account all of those high, medium, and low papers. So not too bad when you think about it as an average. Um, content development was a little bit lower, and, but genre and uh, disciplinary conventions went up a little bit higher. Our lowest, as you can see, was the sources and evidence one. And that is something that really sort of spawned uh, some action on campus right away, which was kind of exciting. The library got in on it, um, and they created the video that, that talks, about, talks to students about why it's important to find uh, sources and sort them er, and cite them accurately. So um, it was also, there was also some movement from the provost's office and the multi-state collaborative to really put some emphasis on um, sources and citations. So that's something that um, started a campus-wide movement that I think will continue as we go. Um, control of syntax and mechanics was also fairly high with a 2.78. And our, how many papers did we have total? So we had 30 papers total. So that four at the top is really what, that's what the scale is, not the N of the papers that we used. So from that information, we came up with a few recommendations. Um, our first rec recommendation was that we um, request make sure that we request papers that really reflect UWR requirements, because what we found was that not all capstones did. 
Um, so some capstones, depending on the discipline, don't really have that same um, academic writing that was reflected in that rubric. So the rubric didn't match the type of writing that was happening from those di disciplines. So we weren't able to really give accurate scores on some of those papers. So that was one thing that if we were to do it again, we wanna make sure that we're asking for papers from something that was a UWR course. Um, and with that same idea in mind, we think that perhaps there needs to be a larger campus conversation about the UWR framework, what the purpose of that is, and does it, does it provide the flexibility that we need um, to use it across the disciplines, or um, is there, do we need a different uh, framework for some, for some areas? Um, we need to go back and as a faculty really consider the goals of those capstone courses and is it writing? And if it's not writing, then we, we want to make sure we have a common goal in mind for those. Uh, we also always think that more writing is better, so increasing the opportunities for our students to write within their majors and thinking about how that is um, related to their career choices and making sure they're prepared to write in whatever career they uh, decide. Uh, as a result of that sources and evidence, we definitely know that we still need to continue to increase support for students in understanding citations and finding appropriate sources for their writing. So that's something that needs to continue. Um, and also really intentionally scaffolding writing across programs. So how do we start them out when they're uh, young and give them supports that will help them to become better writers as they travel through our system? So when they are at the peak of our system, they're also at the peak of their writing and they're ready to go out into the field and, uh, and be solid and confident writers. Okay, so our third big project, um, which actually spanned a couple of academic years, was this data request um, in the spring of 2016. So this was at the end of our first year of work together as a group. Um, we had these large questions um, that we wanted to see if, if we could get answers to um, through data. Um, so things like whether or not UWRs present a barrier to completion for students, if there's bottlenecks or roadblocks that are occurring with the UWR. Um, what, if any, relationship is there between the UWR and grades? And um, we wanted to see if there were any conclusions that could be drawn between when students take UWRs and how many UWRs students take and certain um, positive outcomes. Um, so with these large questions in mind, um, within each one of these big questions, we had situated very specific data requests, and we made that request of IR, and we got um, from the inimitable Nathan in the Office of Institutional Research a rather robust um, report that took us probably a good couple of terms, um, maybe a whole entire year to get through. So there was a lot, a lot, a lot of information in this, and I'm really just gonna share kind of the highlights that I think that you would be most interested in. And if you're interested in seeing the full report and all of the detail that's available there, that is on the Writing Center website on the WAC page. It's the year two report, um, and you can find a lot more information beyond what I'm gonna share today. So the first thing that we were looking at is whether or not the UWR is presenting a barrier to completion for students. Um, we found that in the period of time that we were looking at, about 20% of courses on average are designated as UWRs. And that came out to 605 distinct sections offered over the course of three years. This is the breakdown of um, UWR sections per discipline over that three-year period. Um, so keep in mind it is three years, not one. And of course, disciplines that serve larger numbers of students are going to have more sections of UWR courses. So I'll give you a minute to look at that and find your discipline or anything that you might be interested in. If you're not seeing something that you're looking for, there is another slide.
The other thing I think is important to note is the time frame here. So those of you who have been around for a while um, will remember 2013 as the year of the sustainability plan. So that was a time of cuts and streamlining. And so um, those programs that you see with fewer sections of UWRs offered over here, um, a lot of those, that's because they were cut during that time. So journalism, um, media arts, um, Spanish was cut down to some degree. And then also EMSA and integrative studies, both of those just were onboarded during that time period. So I don't remember the exact dates. I wanna say 2015 is when both of those came on board. Um, but if we were to look at the most recent three-year period, so 2016 to 2019, we would see higher numbers, I think, with both integrative studies and EMSA. Um, so the data showed that we've got sufficient numbers of UWR sections by disciplines for students to take, so we're not really seeing any bottlenecks there. We're also seeing that there are sufficient unfilled sections over that three-year period and in all modalities, so online, on-site, and on campus, um, in which the caps have not been met. So sufficient unfilled sections where um, we have an average of 14 to 15 students per section, and should students want to take UWR courses in their discipline, there should be courses available for them. So we're not really seeing um, the offerings presenting any kind of a barrier for students. This shows um, the number of students that at the time that we requested this information had not graduated, um, but had started at EOU more than six years prior and had um, 15 or fewer credits to complete before graduation and at least one UWR to complete. We wanted to look at that to see if it were possible that the UWR might be one of the reasons that students were not completing. And you can see the numbers are, are pretty low. So this column of non-completers, um, those are the students that started in each of these years that by 2016 had still not um, earned a degree. And um, I compared this to the numbers, the numbers of completers in each of those years. So this is not necessarily a cohort number right here. This is just the number of degrees that were awarded in 2012. So it's, it's the six-year graduation rate, which is kind of the, the standard rate. And so all of those numbers in the completers column, um, that's just showing how many degrees we gave out. So they're not really, it's, it's a little bit apples and oranges, but I just wanted to show that um, in order to better illustrate that the numbers in the non-completer columns did not really raise any concerns for us. So this is, again, the six-year graduation rate. So this is showing um, for students who take at least one, I guess I shouldn't say take, for students who successfully complete at least one UWR course during their first year, those students have a higher six-year graduation rate than students who do not successfully complete a UWR in their first year. We also extended that to look at students who um, completed two or more UWR courses in their first two years. And you can see there are differences. So the graduation rates or the six-year completion rates are higher for students who took those UWRs early. But it's not quite as marked as the previous slide, so for students who took it in the first year. We also compared the GPAs between those two groups and um, saw that there were slightly higher GPAs for students who did take UWRs early um, than students who took them, you know, waited until maybe junior or senior year in order to complete their, their writing requirements. Um, in terms of GPA, we also wanted to look at the number of UWR courses that students take on average. So they're required to take four, two lower division, one of which is writing 121, and two upper division. Um, but many students are taking a lot more than four, so six, seven, or eight. And we wanted to see if those students that are taking a lot more UWRs had more positive outcomes, um, such as higher GPAs, and we did not find that to be the case. Um, so no real differences between students that are taking the bare minimum of the UWRs and who are taking extra UWRs beyond what's required in terms of GPA. 
we did see that GPAs in UWR courses are consistently lower than GPAs in non-UWR courses, which is probably not a surprise if you teach a UWR course um, because they are challenging for students. So this is that GPA breakdown. So by year and then by lower division and upper division, you can see what those differences are. In terms of recommendations, <clears throat> I think that our hope is that um, all of this is going to generate some interest and some conversations among the faculty about what the UWR should be, what it looks like now, if we're satisfied with that, um, what we might want to examine a little bit further, and we're kind of hoping that people will come up with their own recommendations, but there's a few things that we wanted to highlight um, based on our discussions and based on what we saw. First year students may benefit from being advised to take at least one UWR in their first year, and that's because we do see that positive outcome associated with timely completion as well as GPA for the students that are taking the UWR in their first year. Now, I think this is already happening, and I also think that there is often a really good reason why you would advise a student not to take a UWR in conjunction with other courses, you know, depending on the workload that that student has in that particular major. So um, I think those conversations need to happen by and with the people who advise first-year students. We did see that upward trend in terms of the number of UWR sections offered in each discipline, as well as the number of UWR um, courses that students are taking. You know, there's a, a slow uptick in the numbers of students or the number of UWR courses that are being taken, and I think that needs to be monitored in consideration of the fact that we're not seeing any correlation with um, grades or timely completion along with taking more UWRs. So that's something that um, we should keep an eye on, especially in consideration of workload um, for faculty. Uh, we did see that enrollments are a little bit higher in the spring, so we're still not really seeing any bottlenecks there. We're not seeing any problems in the spring, but as we grow enrollment, that's something we would want to keep an eye on to make sure that students that are preparing for graduation are able to access the courses that they need in order to graduate. And then lastly, this is just something that's not shown by our data. You know, we, we think that we need to have bigger conversations that examine um, whether or not our writing instruction is, is doing what we want it to do, whether or not it's promoting transfer of those skills across disciplines and across the student's academic experience. We've reached the end of our, our presentation of data. There's a lot more available in the um, the reports, the first and second year report, and something we won't touch on thoroughly is the work we did with first year uh, writing and UWR courses. We had such a small sample of papers submitted to us that we can't really publish any data without uh, possibly um, revealing which classes and students were involved. And so we're, we're um, uh, hesitant to do that. However, we did find in the first year uh, papers that the same um, lower uh, scores or lower, lower ratings in um, using sources was present, pretty much the same, the same proportion. So you have heard the recommendations for each of these parts of this presentation, and we have a couple of questions for you before we open it up to, uh, up to the floor for discussion. First of all, what do, you, what do you, as faculty, want to do regarding writing across the curriculum? As many of you know, I'm, re I'm retiring at the end of this year, and I would like to, uh, I, I want to know that you're aware that this is an important um, a function of the university, and someone else on campus may be as interested in it as I've been. This has been my research for the last few years, few years, and I needed the support of the WAC group and able to carry it out. It's been a wonderful group to work with. I couldn't ask for better partners than this. Um, but now, as we come to an end, we have to make a decision as a campus. 
do we have the beginnings of a WAC program? Is this something that's a springboard into further, um, further investigation, further development, further faculty development workshops? Uh, one thing that's clear to me about WAC programs is that it needs to come from the grassroots. It's not going to work if the administration imposes it on us. This needs to come from us as faculty. And in this endeavor, I've considered myself faculty, which I am. And so what I'm, I guess I'm calling you to action as is, uh, is to form a grassroots um, uprising to, to keep WAC going or create some other construction, wild, writing and in information literacy in the disciplines or communication across the curriculum or any one of various configurations of um, communication that supports writing and other, and other um, um, necessary um, disciplines across this campus. As I've done research, I've attended, um, as I mentioned, I mentioned, I've attended a lot of conference presentations, and that clued me into some research that was going on by Cox, Galen, and Meltzer on um, how do you develop and sustain a writing um, across a curriculum program. Um, I, was, I was present for their first discussions and their, and their, um, their smoothing out of their texts and in some of the conference presentations. They published last year a book that I recommend to anyone interested, Sustainable WAC, a Whole Systems Approach to Launching and Developing Writing Across the Curriculum Programs. EOU has already addressed several of the recommended steps toward um, developing a WAC program, be be beginning back with the writing proficiency exam way back, and continuing with the implementation of the UWR and including work undertaken by the WAC group. The WAC group has been working hard for three years, and I would have to say they're tired, <laughs> as, as we all are. But um, um, I think that there's a, a need for this kind of work, and I hope that you will think about it. To that end, we're going to send out a um, survey at the, um, after this presentation to see if there are people who are interested in carrying the work forward. And then the another question that um, we're going to raise, even though I've been told in the past not to even touch the UWR because it was a difficult thing to get through in the first place, but are you satisfied with the UWR framework? You may very well be. It may be doing what you need it to do with your students. But if you're not, what needs to be changed? And do you want to talk about it? Let us know about that. So with that, Watch for a short survey, and um, I welcome any questions you have for any one of us. Thank you. <laughs> I should have said thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to call upon your opinions, I think, more than anything. Um, based upon your understanding and, and work over the past three years with the concept of writing across the curriculum, do you see that concept the same as a university writing requirement? Uh, and if not, uh, would it be appropriate to consider a change in terminology and maybe focus of what we do with the UWR? Um, I think that the, the UWR is actually writing in the disciplines. WAC is the... Um, collaborative approach to making sure that writing is happening throughout the university, across the curriculum, whereas WID, uh, Writing in the Disciplines, is focusing more on those discipline-specific criteria that you teach in your programs. So what we have going now is WID. So at the lower, the, the lower level of the UWR, for example, Writing 121, that's pretty much um, a standard for most students. And that may not be discipline specific. It may be more English writing focused or it might be more science focused depending on what the faculty chooses to teach. But um, from the second lower division course through the two upper division courses that are required, 
um, those are supposed to be discipline specific or they need to be approved by the discipline. So you, the UWR is discipline specific. It's WID. Well, thanks for the presentation. I, I was gonna partly answer the question and make a request too, is that um, am I satisfied with the UWR and, and the classes that we we have in anthropology, I'm completely satisfied, but we um, specifically um, picked certain classes and cut back on some because of faculty um, load. Um, and then what do, would I like to see is that I think that for um, all the colleges is that you rotate having faculty go to those conferences um, so that we spread it out. I was fortunate to be part of the Oregon Writing Project when we were doing it and got sent off as part of the writing team and learned a lot um, during that process. And I know some of the other faculty here went along with me and I think that um, at least in terms of writing and going to any kind of conference, that was the only time I did that was as part of the Oregon Writing Project. And I think that um, um, we would all benefit from it. I just don't think we have enough training. What? An, an opportunity that exists for anyone would be to gather disciplinary faculty from several disciplines or from one discipline together and um, um, consider, a, um, consider s submitting a proposal to the International Writing Across the Curriculums um, Conference, which happens every two years. So it's due again in 2000, it was last year, so 2020. It's due in 2020. Calls for proposals will be coming out probably in the next six months, I'm guessing. I don't know where it'll be located. However, that's one of the places I've gone to learn about WAC and WID and, and other uh, approaches to teaching writing and to help, uh, faculty, to help with faculty development. I'd recommend IWAC as one place. There's also um, other opportunities in the, in the region. In fact, um, if you want to learn more about writing, but you don't want to participate in giving a conference presentation, we have an upcoming uh, two-year college association of the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Northwest Writing Centers Association conference at the end of April in Yakima, so it's close by. This would be an opportunity for you to go and talk to writing professionals, writing experts. Other questions? Well, as I said earlier, you can find the reports that we have published on the WAC page, which is also, uh, you'll find it on the front of the Writing Center page, on the Writing Center site. Um, bottom right, you'll see it there. And then you can go to that page and find those documents. I appreciate, I know that Sarah appreciates, and so does Rhonda, um, you're coming today. Aaron and, and Tony send their regrets because they had other, um, other responsibilities that they were unable to get out of. So um, we have, have been grateful to all of you for all of the participation that you've um, given us over the years, and we'll see where this goes. Think about it. Think what you want in terms of a WAC or a WID or any other kind of a writing-centered program. Thank you very much.